Hello, everybody. Raise your hand if you're ready to get started. My boss taught me that at work. I had never done it before, but it's extremely effective to get people to start it. So anyway, welcome. I want to thank you guys for joining me. My name is Jennifer Johnson. Everybody calls me JJ. You can too. And if you were with us yesterday, we talked about AI and atomic content. And I talked about today being sort of the bummer part of that conversation because I was going to rain on everyone's parade. I hope I don't do that, but what I want to do is talk about why AI is a clarion call for centralized digital asset and content management. And so what I'd like to do is walk you through some slides and then we have built out in Drupal a little image generator to play with some, um, with some image effects and we'll do that. And then I'll open it up to questions. I don't know that I'll take the entire 15 minutes, but I don't, I don't know that anyone will cry if I talk less. So let's get started. I'm gonna start with the statement that AI is gonna require every organization to think about their content asset and data management from strategy from the ground up. That's because data is the foundation for all of AI. And when we're talking about creative works, it is going to be especially consequential because a lot of the, the work that we create is based on the data or the art of folks who can claim copyright protections over that. So, I don't know how familiar everyone is with the concepts of AI, so I just wanted to start out with a, slider, uh, a slide that explains that when I'm talking about AI, it's basically through two lenses. I know there's a lot other lenses of AI, uh, but it's about predictions and about generation. And we look at predictive AI as looking at past trends to predict what's gonna happen in the future. But it's the generative AI I'm gonna talk about today because that's using language to generate images, videos, text that you might wanna use for uh, any purpose in an organization. I have been playing with Mid Journey and Dolly for about a year and a half. And as I've played with it, you can tell it's just getting better and better. And I am not someone who has my hands on the advanced models that even these really technical companies are playing with. Um, but because language is the lever to control the image output, this is just a sampling of a couple of the images I've put on my Facebook feed this year alone, just sort of promoting out the, the concept that we need to be careful when we're talking about what we can create, because this image up here, this image down here, all generated by AI. A lot of LinkedIn folks who, who follow AI know that every day th something's coming through the feed about copyright protections or new people are coming forward asserting uh, copyright ownership over creative works. And I just went in and I grabbed this sample of an, an app that allows you to generate prompts based on artists that are still alive. So Annie Leibovitz, hope you're not mad. Uh, Beatrix Potter, maybe not. Banksy, he seems like he has a good sense of humor, maybe not. But the entire notion is that if anything changes, we are gonna be accountable for what we publish with generative AI. And before I get into the, the real downer of it all, uh, I don't want it to be. I wanna paint the potential of what we can do with AI first because I find it really, really interesting. And so a while back, I was asked to do a presentation uh, for a, a user group and I created some prompts based on something I thought had universal appeal, golf and the water, ocean. So I wanted to take two prompts two simple words and then start putting them through AI so that I could see the effects that my words had on the art. So as I go through these, just know I was kind of messing around, but if I'm doing it, your creators are gonna do it too. So here's golf ball ocean applying a style of contemporary or cartoon-like. And you can already see that when you generate images in Dolly and Mid Journey, it's generally giving you four different prompts to play with. And I don't know, raise your hand if you've been in Mid Journey and you've played with generation. 
All right, you guys tune out because this is going to be boring for y'all. But everyone else, way interested. Um, so what about those same two words put through a genre of pop art and sci-fi art? Already you can see we're seeing different effects. Dreamy and happy. And then we can start combining different moods and genres together to really force different styles on those two words. So again, this is just Gulf Ocean adding a mood and a genre of contemporary and sci-fi art and cartoon and pop art. All right, this is where I noticed I had a typo here, and I'm gonna apologize on behalf of myself because this is mine and I noticed it last night and I didn't fix it, but don't pay any attention to that and look at the happy faces over here because my golf ball is now very happy. And down here, my golf ball is eh, dreamy. We can force different effects by now combining style, mood, and genre. And so, you know, it's kind of fun. Then you get into perspectives. You can force things that you want through perspectives. You can add texture. You can add location. You can add colors along with location. So if I go back a slide, if I figure out how to go back a slide, I've taken three locations, Dallas, Minneapolis, Dubai. I've now added colors of red, white, and blue, purple and gold for Minnesota, and then red, green, and black for Dubai. We can see that the, the, the styles that I established are still there, but we're adding in colors as well. So now we're gonna go hyper and we're gonna go over to Mid Journey because I did a lot of that in Dali, this is over in Mid Journey, and I've used a prompt builder that is, I've built one for this demo in Drupal, but we used an off-the-shelf prompt builder for this a while back to show how we could really get elaborate with the effects. And this is where we can pull in Unreal Engine for the software renderer. We can dictate styles and outputs of cameras and angles. If I were to look through here, we can set hyper-maximalist and hyper-realistic approaches that yada, yada, yada. All this stuff means a lot to photographers, but I'm a writer, so I'm going to fast forward through it. This is another example of just a Norman Rockwell sort of effect on a golf ball. You can see it's the language that controls the output still. My words are golf ball and ocean, but the prompt builder has created an elaborate prompt that allowed me to get this output. And then finally, this is the last image before I break into the bummer news, a 3D rendering of a golf ball suspended in midair. So all of this is to say, these are two words with different language applied to it that have created all these different variations of images. And you can imagine the variations of images you can create with the dictionary at your disposal. Because I just used two words I randomly picked out because I thought golf and ocean sounded fun. So it is fun, right? Well, I think the problem is that the copyright owners whose art and text this is based on are going to be asking for some sort of compensation for what the technology companies have done to build these applications to begin with. If you're somebody who is dead, you may not care that someone is using your art or creating images based on what you've done in the past. But what if you're not dead? This is an artist, Kalinda Wiley, who was included in Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People of the Year of 2018. He was commissioned to paint Barack Obama's portrait in the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery, and it was a really big deal. It led all the newscasts. It was a huge thing. But what if somebody like me could come along and create an image just like that using AI? Now, 
Be honest. Can you tell which one's made with AI? Yes. Yeah. All right, that was too easy. I know, <laughs> you guys are right. That one is. But I was able to take Kalinda Wiley and make a picture of a student in a classroom reading a chalkboard. And would he mind? I would. So the question I have to ask is, he seems like a really good guy. I bet he wouldn't sue me. He'd probably be understanding that I'm in front of you just doing a presentation and trying to sort of make waves. But what about Pixar? Pixar's a huge company, and they have billions and billions of dollars. And if I use their art in a marketing campaign, and they come to ask for the bill, they're not gonna go to the technology companies, or they may go to the technology companies, but they're most likely gonna write the terms and conditions to pass off the blame for the people who are doing the art at the end result. So I don't have to read a set of terms and conditions to know after working in technology for as many years as I have that the blame goes downward to the people who do the work and that's what I'm asking you just to think ahead about what your teams are gonna do with this technology. I was a, a journalist when I logged into ChatGPT for the first time and I immediately went to LinkedIn and I wrote 600 words about how I thought my job was going to end. I literally said, boss, don't read this, because I said, I ask it to do my job. I ask it to write a full article on creative automation, which is the blending of data and assets together to form creative collateral. It did it. I was a copywriter in my former job. I read it. It was good quality. Now, Photoshop is building generative AI into all of its applications. So if you've used Photoshop and you know anything about vector-based creative artwork, we can now layer files together and create background images that are strictly AI. That doesn't mean that people are going to be able to necessarily retrieve artists' work through those applications. You know, gently over time, I'm sure we'll be able to have stop words so that we wouldn't be able to say, use it in the style of Pixar. But what if I could achieve the same output that Pixar could achieve with other language? Is that still copywritten? Is it still a danger for my organization? And so it's through that lens that I only say, this is the cause for control. And it doesn't mean controlling what your teams do. It means controlling how you would cre handle the situation if anything went wrong with AI, which is what is going to happen. Over time, these artists whose work is, is in these engines are gonna come and they're going to ask to be paid. And the fact that they ask to be paid is something that the courts are gonna have to deal with. You know, I don't really, I'm not a lawyer, I don't know anything, but I do know that sinking feeling in my stomach when I manage newsrooms and we had something go wrong and we had to explain to lawyers that our simple act of trying to do things right was what prevented getting a suit. We, had, we could say we were trying to do the right thing and this is the way we were trying to do it. And be honest, we have an audit trail of how we force people to think about the long-term consequences. We trained our editors so that they wouldn't make these mistakes. And because we had that, when our editors made the inevitable mistake, because they're just out of college, they're, they're learning journalism, we were able to avoid the real financial penalties that could have easily been leveled against us. And so it's in that spirit again, I say, and this is gonna be real dramatic, but I'm having problems with my clicker. Going into the AI era without a strategy is a blinking red light on your operations dashboard. And it's something I would like everyone to consider. And I wanted to paint a picture of what it means to try to pull something back from a marketing ecosystem if there is a problem 
And so I came up with this use case. It's going to resonate, I hope. I hope it hits. If not, you guys will be all right. At the beginning of the pandemic, Kentucky Fried Chicken had to change their logo from finger licking good to another logo that was anything but finger licking good because they were like, people, please keep your hands away from your face, right? <laughs> so I tried to imagine the life of this marketing manager, what their life would be like. Okay, finger licking good, it's literally on every chicken bucket in every store. It's on every napkin. It's on every, how would you possibly pull it back? Well, a lot of digital asset management systems now hold images close to the vest and make them public over a content delivery network so that you can have that one-stop control to pull things back if you need to. And I'm not going to talk about specific technologies here, but I am going to talk about the capabilities when you take your creative assets and you put them in the cloud, because when you put them in the cloud, you can expire them from the cloud. You can expire the links that are in the cloud if there's any problem with legal assets that are out there in the ecosystem. And you can use technology to control the creative layers that are served out in the cloud via an API. And what do I mean by that? If you have an ad, let's say it's out of a, a digital asset management system, it's a one-to-many publishing proposition. If you're doing it right, you're taking one ad and you're putting it across multiple ecosystems so that if you ever need to pull it back and there's ever anything wrong, it's one-stop shop. So what does it mean to take your creative layers to the cloud? Well, if this is layer one to the left and this is layer two to the right, what we want to do is keep them in a digital asset management system and then make them public and deliver these assets out to the cloud via public links. And these links are just URLs that can be expired or controlled. They're not in a media library as a flat image URL just sitting there waiting for a, a creator to do something with them. It's a URL out there at a content delivery network so that if there's anything wrong, we can pull it back. Or in the case of creative layering, we could replace this finger licking good with something like this. No finger licking, please. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, a, don't, I know. KFC is going to sue me, but. So when I do that approach, I can keep my background layer and my digital asset management system with its public URL. I can replace layer two out on the CDN with my new Lego layer, and automatically I can pull whatever is offensive out of the ecosystem. And I say this only because with AI assets, it can be the same thing. If you're out of a digital asset management system and you are actually having to ex exercise governance over that image, you can set properties on, like ex link, link expiration properties. You can track usage of where that asset is used in the ecosystem. You can flag that asset so that it can be designated as an AI asset or not. So if you need to audit it, you can, that sort of thing. So with that, I'm gonna go over to Drupal Yesterday, we showed you several use cases we had created um, for AI, and one of them was this image quick create that I'm going to show you just because I wanted to be able to demonstrate how we can use Drupal to do something as simple as a mid-journey prompt builder. So for those of you not in the session yesterday, we talked about we used two different technologies using this solution. We used AI Interpolator and then AI Augmenter, which are both modules that are available in Drupal. And the Augmenter is the prompt engineering interface, where if I go in here, this is the prompt, this is what it's going to say, act like an image creator, 
create a mid-journey prompt based on the input that captures the user's intent and is creative, concatenate the fields together in a way that makes sense based on this input, and this is what the user fills out in the form. If I were to go to my content type of image quick create, we've created fields for style, a prompt, perspective, an artist. And when I look at this on a page, I can say, <laughs> golf ball, I had to, golf ball, ocean, and ocean. Let's say it's in the artist in the style of Roy Lichtenstein. We want it to be stained glass, and we want the perspective to be from below. When we generate this prompt, it's going to go to Augmenter. It's going to get my prompt. It's going to return it to this payload here in this field. And it's basing all of its output on the combination of these outputs together. And we had this hooked up to Dolly before and we decided to use it with mid-journey, so I'm gonna go over to my Discord and just show you what this like renders on a page here. So if I go into Discord now and I say, imagine my prompt, I can paste in my output. And for anybody who doesn't use mid-journey, it's a chat-like interface where you put in your prompt and you can see at the bottom it's generating out a percentage of the images. And these are the four thumbnails that it generated. Which ones do we like the best? One, two, two. two. All right. If we wanted to upscale two, we could upsource this, and this delivers it out to the content delivery network, and I can use it here. You see it's out there on Discord CDN. If I wanted to create variations of this image, I can create variations by going back up and saying, everybody liked two, but maybe they want to see variations of two, and now it's going to generate me four new thumbnail images based on two. It takes a while because it's kicking off a new job. It's actually using Discord to communicate with backend services in order to return the images back through here. But as we watch it render out, the thing I'd ask you to, to contemplate is, if this is this easy for me to do, how likely is it that your creators are doing this right now? Either on their own, on their own machines, on their weekends. They're messing with this technology. They're wanting to use it, and they will. They will, because it's irresistible once you get into it. It's very easy and attainable. And because the language is what controls the application language and not coding, if I don't like what that prompt generates, I can go in there and I can change my prompt to change what the application generates. And that modifiable reality that's not in the hands of developers anymore. It's not behind any release process. It's not behind any structured thought of like a sprint team or safe agile or anything that a, a mature digital organization would rely on. This is like old school inventive stuff, right? And these people who are creators are going to get in here and do this because it is irresistible and it is going to be built in everywhere. And if I, as a journalist, can spend one afternoon building out this prototype app to show a group in Portland what we could possibly build, and it took me 20 minutes to build this little prototype, what's gonna happen in five years? Five months, you know? So, with that, you know, I'm going to stop there and ask if there's any questions, because I kind of drilled through everything within 30 minutes, but I do have something else I want to show you guys 
if you're interested, but I'm happy to answer any questions first. All right, let's talk about Photoshop and generative fill because I want you guys to see, hopefully it'll let me log in. Every time I go to do something dramatic like this, I get a login screen that makes me authenticate with Adobe two-factor authentication and it takes a while. So if we're unable to do this, that's okay. You guys won't be. So what do I mean by generative fill? This is my coworker, Sydney. We participated in a hackathon together. Down here, I can remove the background of the photo. And there is, within here, I have to put my glasses on. Where's the generative fill? Here. What would you like to fill? Maybe I'm interested in Sydney being on a prairie surrounded by Texas wildflowers. Sydney's gonna be so flattered that we did this to her. Don't tell her we did this. <laughs> now it disappeared, Sydney because my layers are out of order. So now that this is its own background, if I wanted to change it, I could change it to Sydney on a yacht in the ocean. Oh, dang it, I pressed enter too quick. That would have been, that would have been beautiful. Um, so as this renders out, I'm gonna say this functionality is being built out across a lot of the Adobe Cloud Suites. It's being built out in almost every content management system I work in. It's being built out in Creative Clouds, which is why going back to the deck, I just have some key takeaways and then I'm gonna open it up for questions and let you guys go off and have a great afternoon. My key recommendations are just to think about the damage that could be done if you don't do anything. And doing some simple things up front like building flags into your digital asset management system for AI assets would be helpful. What is an AI asset? It's a true false flag against an asset, is it generated or not? If it is generated, what prompt was used? Because then we can run an audit within the dam to say, was Pixar used in the prompt? And if Pixar was used in the prompt, let's pull the image back and use some watermark or some sort of identifier to identify it. The next thing I'm gonna say is, audit for AI usage regularly, and I say regularly because if you're not using a whole lot of AI, it's not like you need to build it into your workflow, but the people who run your content operations, if you're gonna use AI, need to make this part of their beat. They need to go into the dam, they need to audit whether or not the teams are using AI assets, and more than that, they need to talk to their teams about the guidelines of the usage. How are they using it? What are they using? What applications are they using? And do those teams have a keen understanding of the risks of what could go wrong? Because I actually believe people wanna do the right thing. They're earnestly trying to do the right thing. If we can build in little guardrails at the beginning to make sure that this stuff is at least tracked, then if something does go wrong, you don't have an operational nightmare on your hands and you have teams that are there to assist you as you go down the AI journey because they're gonna be your foot soldiers, not me. But we just need to protect them for what's to come. 
Digital rights management. A lot of dams have digital right management systems built in because it's all about protecting copywritten rules for if you've got Getty images or AP images, you don't want those out on your CDN without any governance behind them. That's a simple layer that you could use to protect against AI assets now. Now, DRM is usually used to say, okay, only images that are in this territory or in, of this media type could be used by this customer, but it's just a feature to protect assets and it's something that you could easily modify or configure to help you achieve your goal of, of AI governance. Create watermarks. A lot of dams have watermarks for company overlays so people can't go in and say, pull an image out willy-nilly of a dam. Just create a watermark that says this is AI generated and you'll know you'll be safe. That way, if anyone ever does want to use that asset, they have to seek permission and you can grant it and your audit trail will indicate that you granted it and you've automatically protected your rear. And the last thing I'm going to say is, I love AI. I don't love what AI is going to do. I don't love the potential of it on a negative side. I'm captivated by it from a technology perspective because I think the potential is so vast, but the dangers are also pretty vast. So I tried to do both of these presentations like excited about AI, but also just trying to make everybody think about the potential consequences operationally if you're going to use it. And it all goes back to the central premise that to get maximum value from AI, you're going to have to control the data underneath it. Because that data, whether it's the prompts, whether it's CRM data and a content management system, whether it's content, content is data, it's going to be the foundation for AI moving forward. And if you don't have control of it, it's going to control you. Um, and I don't want to see that happen. So. Thanks for coming, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Oh, you guys, you're kind. You don't have to. <laughs> Is it true that if anything that you generate with AI, you cannot trademark? I have not heard that you cannot trademark it, because I thought that that was an open question. But I think that that's one of the questions that will be asked. And it goes back to like that Pixar example or the 3D generation of the 3D. What if there's an animation that's never had a 3D rendering? Like uh, I used to be a fan of Garfield before they made Garfield 3D. What if I came in and made their character 3D? Is that new? Is that you know old? Could I trademark that because it's a new creative work? I'm going to have to rely on the courts to figure it all out. But I'd flag it if I. Still, if you for your brand, like you want to control your brand imagery, so it can it be. Yeah, I would say it would be. I was captivated by the call center uh, use case for generative AI because it was not creative. When we deal with these creative use cases, I would I would have a lot of the concerns you're you're raising. Not to say that you shouldn't do it, but before you do it, think long and hard about how you're going to do it, so that if you have to change what you do, you're protected. Any other questions? On the images, it would sound like you might have to have multiple tags, like you were using somebody else's image and then messed with it with AI, and potentially. I think that might be right, like per potentially a conditional flag that says this is an AI image and if it's there, here's the prompt that was included in it. I would even go a layer deeper and say this is the service it was generated through because different software partners are going to reach different agreements with these technology companies in the background that are probably going to say some creative work can be used in the background. All of this is going to happen iteratively over the next two or three years, two or three decades, but I wouldn't know the rules to say to follow, which is why I'm just like, protect yourself, because it's going to change, and it will change immediately. Connecting that metadata to the data itself. 
Yes. Right. Absolutely. And I think if you can do that, then if you have to pull that asset back, you've got all the audit trails on that asset that you would be worried about. And that's, that's going to be the key to showing, I think, the due diligence if you ever did get in trouble, just to say that you, you tried. No. <laughs> well, yeah, it could be all of that. It could be chained AI to, we could go in loops on this forever, yeah. Great. But I'm just like thinking ahead, like nobody's going to want their images online anymore if, you know, they're creative artists. So I'm wondering if there's anything that you've seen that's going to like block basically. Yeah. I heard, I did hear some technology of, of being able to put in stop words in the technology so that you couldn't generate, you know, words that artists didn't want you to generate. Uh -huh. Then probably some level of application control through the APIs so that you could set governance. Because this is all APIs and the fact that they could authenticate these layers if they wanted to will be what the courts have to figure out. Um, but I think you're right, that's where it's gonna be seen. How do the technology companies end up working with the artists, and then how do you guys navigate around what those unknowns are? Because it's gonna shift, those, sh those sands are shifting every day. And it's just if you don't do anything now to prepare your teams for tagging assets and just marking it, it sounds like you're already doing that. Um, that's wonderful, but if you're not, you know, it's it's time to start, so. Holly, she has a question. I do have a question for you, and it kind of speaks to your question. Um, since you've studied this uh, for a while, do you have any recommendations about the ethics around um, denoting that an image is AI generated when it's put in its, you know, whatever channel it's pushed through in its final form? I believe that you should mark it first of all in the dam, as an asset that is generated so that no one can use it without understanding that it is generated from AI. And then I believe you should attribute it in the credit so that when it's on the display layer, there's no ambiguity that it was generated by AI. Isn't it like what Fox News got in trouble for with their composite images in there? Ooh, I didn't hear about this, tell me. Oh. They had to put like a composite image footnote in like the images themselves. That's interesting to me because I think back to, I don't know, I'm old, but um, d does anybody remember when OJ was arrested and they did the Time Magazine cover and it was the first example of people using pixel art to darken the face artistically and I think this is gonna be kind of the same thing. It's a whole new world order and we just need to think about being good stewards, and that, I think, is gonna earn trust. If anything ever goes wrong, it's like, at least we can say we tried to do the right thing. Now, Michelle, did you have your hand up? Oh, darn it, all right. Yeah. You know, to be honest, as a consultancy, we, we, we deal with clients and they come to us with questions about points of view, and that's where I sort of went down this rabbit hole. 
I've dealt more with clients, legal departments asking questions and what they should do. And because I was a journalist who dealt with creative work so much, I had a perspective that kind of lent to this presentation today, which is less informative than more just like I've been sued before uh, as a news manager over things that my teams had done and not having, if I had not done the right thing by them, by training them, and we, we didn't have that talk track, we would have been in a large set of trouble. And this just seems like a clarion call for that. Like, think ahead about what might go wrong, train, train your teams around using the tools responsibly, and then keep an eye on the news because the headlines are coming. Just don't know when. Can I share a comment? Yes. Back Please. 1993 Daily College newspaper. Our photographer took a photo of an artwork that a student made, and it was of Bert and Ernie in a intimate position. And we put that in the newspaper, ran the story. <laughs> Children's Television, Television Network found it. We were on um, headline news that night oh, wow. of getting sued. So of course, you know all the <laughs> He didn't know. He didn't know. You don't know what's going to happen. So when you think no one's going to find it or look for it, they, they just might. So just protect yourself. So that's that caution you're saying. I'm just backing you on. Yeah. Think ahead because it's very possible they'll find you and find it, and then you're in trouble. Yep. Michelle's my new John Madden, everybody. I'm Pat Summerall. She's backing me up. All right. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate it. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>